Okay, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome again. Uh, I'm Chris Marquis. I'm a professor at Cornell's Business School, and welcome to this live SubChina CEO webinar recording of the China Corner Office podcast, a show focused on leaders and companies facing the challenges and opportunities of doing business in China. Today's webinar is in partnership with the U.S.-China Business Council, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization representing over 250 American companies doing business with China. And our topic today is how firms in the state of Michigan, so the U.S. state of Michigan, have continued to do business in China in recent years, uh, uh, specifically focusing on the uh, experiences of one important company, Cherry Central Co-op, as well as a number of state-level policies and programs for business. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm really looking forward to this discussion, which is not only about a very important area in U.S.-China commercial relations, but also I think will shine light on some unique stories of entrepreneurship and how the U.S. government, state-level governments, other organizations can help support that. So with us today, we have a number of Michigan-based participants involved in international business, especially as it relates to China. So we have Mark Becker, who is Director of International Supply at Cherry Central Co-op. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have Erkan Kokis, who is Assistant Director for International Trade Research at the Michigan State University International Business Center. Welcome, Erkan. Thank you, Chris. And we have Kendra Ko, Director of the Grand Rapids Office of the U.S. Commercial Service, which is part of the U.S. Commerce Department. Welcome, Kendra. Hi, good to be here. Thank you. And also Alyssa Tracy, last but not least, who is Director of International Trade at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Hello. Uh, welcome, Alyssa. Thank you, Chris. Great. So, uh, I'd like to get started actually uh, focusing on uh, Cherry Central Co-op. So my first question is gonna go out to you, Mark. Can you just give us a general overview of Cherry Central, its businesses, maybe products as well, also some of the international scope, particularly as it relates to China? Sure, and thank you for the opportunity to be here, Chris. So our story here at Cherry Central is kind of a specialty crop. Uh, and we were formed back in 1973, where five growing processing groups in Michigan were located in Traverse City, Michigan, which is kind of the northwest corner. And they formed together to better grow, process, and market their fruit. And the, the co-op as a whole has been in the international trade really since 1973, uh, supplying many different companies and so really what makes us a uh, kind of unique is we are the largest in the world grower processor of Mount Marinzi cherry, which is a variety of cherry that's a little bit different than what you might see in a grocery store, which is typically your fresh, dark, sweet cherries. So we have growers and processors really from coast to coast in the West out in Washington, all the way to uh, Canada and Ontario, Canada. There's 12 factories in between hundred, hundreds of growers. They bring the, the cherries when they come off of the trees to our factories. And so we're growers, processors. And then we basically, what we're going to do is we need to process them very quickly into uh, dried, frozen purees, concentrates, uh, and juice. And really that's kind of kind of what we do, who we are. Uh, the Cherry Central as the co-op really handles the day-to-day -day operations. So our growers can focus on growing and processing the Montmorency cherries. And, you know, as far as our, our China business, um, I think we'll probably get that into that in a little more detail as we go along, Chris, but in general, that's kind of who we are and, and what we do. Yeah, great. I'd love to hear, you know, just digging into that a little bit uh, more, you know, maybe what some of the key selling points are as you uh, have entered the China market. I think mainly since 2017 is when you really started your big push. Is that right in China? Yeah, that's that's right. We started our business in China before 7, 2017. Um, and how we got our start in China was working with a U.S.-based company who also had, say, a sister company in China. 
And that's really kind of where we, where we started. And from there, um, our, our president and some of our owners had taken trips over to China as part of a governor's trade mission from the state of Michigan to really take part in some of the events. And that's kind of how we really got started in the market. Uh, as far as the unique perspective of the Mount Morenzi cherry, as I mentioned, it is a sour variety. And there are sour cherries grown in other parts of the world. But really, what I think stands out and what we need to focus on is a Mich uh, not just a Michigan, but a, a U.S. specialty crop is we're not necessarily the cheapest place on the block where you can purchase or source sour cherries. Uh, there's also a lot grown in Turkey and also in Eastern Europe. And so what we focus on is the health benefits. There's been many, many studies focusing on the health benefits of the Mount Morenzi cherry. And then also we have a very bright red, unique color versus some of the other varieties in the world. And if anyone knows anything about, about China, just take a look at their flag. Red, uh, bright red is a, quite a popular color. So that helps to set us apart. And we need to find special ways and unique ways to promote our product. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's not always all about price. So my job, our job is to point out some of those differences and really build the value. Why should somebody pay more for a sour cherry when they can get it cheaper somewhere else? So that's kind of our focus. Yeah, no, thank you very much for filling that in. And, and as you mentioned, you know, as we go, you know, we'll definitely be unpacking a lot more about your business in China. Uh, but before sort of getting to those further details, you know, I'd really like to actually talk to Kendra, Urkan, and Alyssa to learn more about what your respective organizations are doing to help support businesses like Cherry Central as they go global and particularly uh, go to China. So Kendra, maybe we'll start with you. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so I'm with the U.S. Commercial Service, which is the export promotion arm of the International Trade Administration, which is the Bureau of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And uh, we help companies to compete globally by providing them with market research, training, advocacy, and introductions to international connections. Uh, specifically in China, we have our secret sauce is kind of working with our, with our embassies and consulates in China. We have six offices there, including Hong Kong. Um, if you include Hong Kong, and then we have Beijing, Shanghai, Wuhan, and Shenyang. Uh, so we have a, a good coverage there, and we also have a great office team of China specialists in our DC office. Um, and working with the commercial service, um, we worked with Mark and his team during Export Tech this last spring. Uh, it was kind of a, I think it was spring, you know, with, the, with uh, COVID, it all kind of blends together, but it was spring. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we worked together with him on an Export Tech training program which is a national program that was developed by the U.S. Commercial Service and the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Um, here in Michigan, we do that in partnership with MEDC, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, our volunteers at the Michigan District Export Councils, and also local universities like MSU and GVSU. Um, so it was really a pleasure to get to work with him. And the goal of the program is to help companies to develop a strategic market, international market plan. Um, so to help them develop the plan and then also help them get started implementing it. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's so interesting. And, you know, for, for me, uh, you know, I didn't realize actually the extent to which there are these infrastructures that exist to really help U.S. businesses go global, you know, both, I mean, you're with the federal government, but then also we'll talk a little bit to Melissa, Alyssa about the, you know, Michigan State. But could you say a little bit more about this U.S. commercial services uh, uh, program. So you're in the Grand Rapids yeah. office. So I assume that right. there must be an office in Detroit, maybe somewhere yep, else. We have an office in Detroit it, and East Michigan. And really, uh, we can connect with any, uh, we, we support every, uh, every state in the US. So and then we're connected with the US embassies and consulates in over 70 countries. So um, chances are, you can connect with somebody who's just down the street from you or somewhere in your state to get that kind of hands on export counseling and, and they can serve as your account manager as you connect with markets like China and other countries too. Yeah, so interesting, Th thank you. Uh, so why don't we switch from the sort of federal government level to the state level. And so Alyssa, would you mind saying a little bit about your work at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation? I'd be happy to, thanks Chris. Uh, at the MEDC, our international trade program has three primary goals when it comes to supporting exporters. We aim to 
One, grow the number of companies overall in the state that export. Uh, two, we want to grow the total value of Michigan's export sales. And finally, we want to help existing exporters enter or expand into new markets. And we have three primary tools that we lean on to help support these three goals. Um, I'll start with our flag flagship program, the MyStep grant, the Michigan State Trade Expansion Program. This allows Michigan to offer small businesses up to $15,000 per year in funding to attend trade shows, cover international marketing and e-commerce expenses, international compliance testing, much, much more. Among the newer items that we've added to the uses of the grant over the past year, um, partially in response to the pandemic, um, include this new, the new expense of compliance testing, as well as international certifications. Uh, the CCC or the China Compulsory Certificate is an example of certification that exporters to China will need. And the costs for that certification are covered by our MyStep grant. Um, the second thing that I wanna uh, briefly touch on is our network of foreign offices. Um, we have a network um, that supports Michigan exporters with B2B matchmaking during trade missions and trade shows throughout the year. Um, they also provide free support to companies like market research and market entry strategy. Uh, we do have a dedicated office in China that supports Michigan companies looking to enter or expand into the Chinese market. Um, the, last, uh, the last tool that I'll touch on here is our strong network of small business services. Uh, they offer multi-country market research, uh, which Aircon uh, will likely go over in a little bit more detail, um, individual legal trainings, website localization, and several more items to help companies really take that next step with some of the nitty gritty um, involved in handling those export sales. Um, if a company is interested in marketing their product to the Chinese market, they can utilize, they can tap into really our small business services programming to create a mini version of their website that is translated into Chinese and search engine optimized to be more easily found to prospective Chinese customers. So we, we work really closely wow. with Kendra's team um, throughout the state with Aircon um, to really reach as broad of a number of Michigan exporters as possible, if Michigan companies that might be considering exporting and um, really support them at every step of the way um, to make sure that they are confident and successful in those export endeavors. Great. Thanks so much. Again, I'm sort of really just blown away about the sort of level and expansiveness of the support get given to businesses within Michigan and most likely in many other states as well. Right. Uh, and I'd love to turn to you now, Erkan. Uh, but before doing so, I'd like to remind everyone that they can actually be asking questions. And there is a Q&A function that is separate than the chat. Please don't put your questions in the chat because it, I probably won't see them. If you could put them in the Q&A, that would be great. Uh, if you could just put them in as they come up, that's that works out really well because maybe then I can intersperse them into our discussion in a place, you know, where, where they may fit. So please be entering your questions in the in the Q and A. Great. So now we get to turn to, to Urkan, who I, who I must admit, you know, as a, as a graduate of the University of Michigan in Arbor, you know, have a little bit of rivalry with, with Michigan <laughs> State, uh, although, you know, your guys are doing such great work there. You know, it's really, you know, I'm sort of, sort of proud of be, having some connection to Michigan. So uh, would you mind describing your work a little bit, Urkan? Of course. And thank you again, Chris, for ha having us um, and having this uh, uh, discussion all together. So. IBC International Business Center is located in the Broad College of Business at Michigan State University. It's uh, one of the 15 cybers uh, designated by the Department of Education. Cyber stands for Center for International Business Education and Research, and really focuses on providing um, guidance on anything, anybody on international business related um, uh, fields. Uh, as an integral part of the business college, of course, we support the instructors, the faculty, the researchers and students by providing them resources and tools for their uh, teaching and learning purposes of international business. But of course, when it comes to the businesses as an again, integral part of 
the uh, Michigan uh, community. We also do a lot of arts, uh, outreach to the Michigan companies in partnership with um, um, the US Commercial Service, MEDC, and other um, uh, government agencies and other organizations, of course, across the state. I have to say, Michigan uh, has a very strong ecosystem of integrated partners helping the exporters um, um, in the state. So as, as IBC, there are a couple of tools and programs that I would like to highlight that uh, we try to help the exporters with. One of them is the Michigan Export Growth Program. Michigan Export Growth Program was established with a seed grant um, by the Ford, um, um, uh, um, uh, for, by Ford in general years ago. And then it has taken over by MEDC and MEDC has been funding that program for years now. In this successful partnership, we try to deliver customized international business reports to small to medium sized Michigan companies. Those companies really do have limited resources when it comes to finding information about the market potential in these remote locations. But the university has great resources, the library, the faculty, the, the professionals, the researchers have a lot of experience that they can share with the, these companies. So that's what we do. And while doing this, we also utilize uh, a student uh, group that we employ here as student researchers and try to give them an, uh, uh, um, uh, an opportunity for experiential learning of international business. They work with these companies very closely while they are experiencing and learning about communication and business communication skills, while they are also working on international business related research and writing those successful reports. And again, this is one of the programs that we have a huge demand for. Another thing we have for the Michigan companies, and of course, for that matter, for all the US companies, uh, is a website, an international business portal called Global Edge. The URL is in short, globaledge.msu.edu. That portal, that business website or website has more than 1.5 million new visitors every year. It has about 4.5 million page views every year. And what we do with that website is we provide information on every country, country profiles, anything from the governments to um, the economies, to statistics of trade, to um, um, other information on those countries. We also have profile information on industries and uh, 50 states and trade blogs. We also have tools there to help companies to understand the market potential in these remote locations such as the market potential index, a study that we publish every year um, measuring the market uh, attractiveness of 97 largest economies across the globe. So the companies can see the market potential in those countries. Um, uh, another service that we have is uh, um, a, another website, a website that we put together with MEDC, exportmi.org. And with exportmi.org, we provide information to the Michigan business specifically about international business related events that are taking place in the state. And we have a services director there for these Michigan businesses, for those companies who need um, a law firm that is an expert on international law or translation services in certain parts of the world. They can easily go find um, vetted companies there. And when I say vetted, I'm, I'm talking about the comp those companies are, you know, well established companies and we try to list only those service providers there. So in a nutshell, this is what we do for the businesses as the International yeah. Business Center. Th th thank you so much, Arkan. And it's, you know, great to hear about these different web resources. So, you know, Jesse from SubChina has put those in the chat and then the email that we send out afterwards will also include those both the global edge, but then also the export mi.org. And I just want to say to the folks, um, you know, tuning in today, you know, you may not be in Michigan, but my guess is there's one of these cyber centers that Erkan mentioned in your state. 
There's obviously other folks from the U.S. commercial services in your state, probably an organization like the MEDC, and probably with just some quick Googling around, you, you, you can find out these different resources that are, that are more applicable if you happen to be not in Michigan. So it's a really amazing overview of this you know, impressive ecosystem that, that exists within U.S. states to help with our companies uh, exporting. Uh, I'd love to talk uh, a little bit more about Cherry Central's specific experience with these. So it's great to hear in abstract and some examples of these services. But, you know, Mark, would you say a little bit more about the work that uh, your company has done with a variety of different either federal or state or university-based uh, support services? Yes, uh, Cherry Central, we, again, we're a, a specialty crop, so our, we're, we're owned by our growers, which, um, as most farmers, they don't have unlimited budgets. So what we've really done a good job of over the last oh, many, many years is working with organizations such as the, you know, the three organizations that are here today, they've all been hugely helpful. But then I think the, the biggest resource for agriculture at least would really trace back to the farm bill and within the farm bill from a federal level there's money that trickles down for companies such as ours cooperatives such as ours uh, specifically it's the map fund so market access program funds and we work with a, a third party called food export midwest which there are also food export northeast uh, there is a, a SUSADA, it's called, I, forgive me, I forget what the acronym stands for, but then there's also a WUSADA out in the West. So kind of each region within the country has access to these funds. Uh, you apply for, uh, basically, it's called the branded program. And we put in our application with very, very detailed plans. Anytime you're looking for federal dollars, you've got to make sure all your I's are dotted, T's crossed. So we do this. Um, we're actually starting the process now for the 2022 year, planning out our marketing efforts. And we can receive, if done correctly, up to 50% reimbursement. And so how do, how do you use that? Well, we use it for going on trade missions. Um, so if there is a, whether it's a Michigan focused or just, uh, you know, any kind of product focused really to various countries, China specific, I've been on many of those missions and basically how that works is you, you go over there with the other groups and there's typically, I'd say five to 10 different companies in, in the food or ag and they kind of set up uh, store tours. You get to go out and you get to see some products on the shelves, understand the pricing and all this is arranged for you. It's, it's really stress-free if you're new to exporting don't be intimidated, go, they take good care of you. And then also usually day two is kind of what I call speed dating where there may be 20, 30, 50 companies that it's just one big room, usually at a, at a hotel somewhere and you sit down you've got your 20, 30 minutes to, to make your presentation, to build value in your brand. And then really the work starts after that where you know it's the follow-up, that's really the most important part. Uh, trade shows. Uh, I think everyone's kind of aware there's trade shows out there. So we take advantage of the branded program for the trade shows. And, you know, that helps to put us in a good spot in the U.S. pavilion and uh, in an affordable way. And we can do a little bit more to make our booth look very professional. Uh, again, we, we are getting that reimbursement. It's not just covering the cost of the show. It's going to help cover the flights. It's going to help cover the hotel, the day-to-day -day incidentals. And that's just really the tip of the iceberg of this program I mean, it can help with website development. It can help with marketing efforts. It can help with promotional items you might pass out at the food shows. And there's dozens more ways that can really help your company um, designing packaging. Uh, it's, it's helped to rebuild our website where we now have a, a China-focused website. And so that's something that is really, really been hugely helpful. And I would say that's, that's one of the biggest things for us. And as an agricultural cooperative, we can qualify for up to $350,000 a year in reimbursement. Now, we, you don't have to use all that, but you can qualify. And so that's a, that's a really big deal. And that's really helped us with uh, really the main program we've used to expand in China and elsewhere around the world. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, not just these different sort of services, you know, market research, websites, networks, connections, but also the financial resources that the different government entities can put to this, you know, expanding American business overseas is really, you know, 
really impressive to me. So thank you, Mark, um, for, for sharing this, the story of Cherry Central. Sure. Uh, I'd like to take, uh, you know, st a step back in some ways. And, you know, we are focusing on Michigan for the, for this webinar. And I think it'd be interesting just to hear a little bit more about Michigan's business with China more generally, you know, different industries, how's it grown over time? Actually, one of the questions in our Q and A feature is, you know, if it's, if it's more and more difficult for Michigan firms to get to China, you know, we've had COVID, you know, sort of on, some ongoing trade tension. So I'd love to maybe start with you, Kendra, just if you could describe the Michigan ecosystem of business in China. Uh, and also I'll ask Alyssa the same questions. She can fill in some gaps as well. Sure, great. Uh, so Michigan uh, and China, China's a very important market for Michigan. We had yeah, a little bit of downturn of exports due to the pandemic. In 2019, it was 3.2 billion of Michigan exports to China. Um, in 2020, it was down to 2.6 billion. Um, but it's still a very strong market for us and, and we see it coming back. Some of the larger sectors for US exports, specifically for Michigan exports to China are transportation equipment, chemicals, machinery, and fabricated, wood, fabricated metal products. Um, and then if you're not located in Michigan and are curious about what some of the best sectors are, uh, your listeners could look at our trade.gov website and look for the country commercial guide where they can find what some of the top sectors are. Great, thanks. And we'll, we'll follow up with that the trade deco and we can you know, sort of send the link or, or the document in the follow-up. So thank you, Kendra. Mm -hmm. uh, Alyssa, how about from your perspective? Can you describe the uh, general features of the state as well? Yeah, absolutely. So Kendra did mention we did have a dip in Michigan um, from 2019 to 2020 in export sales. That was, that, that was pretty significant. Um, but the silver lining on that is that you know, when you look at the past five years from 2015 to 2020, export sales from the U.S. as a whole to China um, have grown nearly 8%. So they've grown about 7.6% since 2015 overall from the United States to China. Um, so there is still that positive trend line um, that I think demonstrates that even with all we've experienced in the last year, that China is still that lucrative competitive market for, um, for companies that are willing and able to compete in it. Um, for Michigan in particular though, um, during that time frame, uh, 2015 to 2020, um, we saw a significant decline um, of goods exported to China. Um, but we did see, you know, during this time of steep drop-offs, um, export sales from 2015 to 2020, we had a slight increase in exports of transportation equipment goods during that period. Um, they rose from about a billion dollars to $1.1 billion. So what that tells us is that that industry sector in particular has remained pretty resilient. Um, you know, the raw export data tells us one side of the story, um, but we've got you know, some anecdotal um, stories from our trade export clients that have had success in entering the Chinese market despite some of the difficulties. Um, and we're hopeful that more companies over the year ahead will continue to pursue China as uh, a lucrative export market with growth opportunity um, to take advantage of. So transportation equipment was one of the only categories um, with, of export sales from Michigan to China that rose during that five-year period from 2015 to 2020. Um, and we've got an example of that actually with um, one of our trade clients. Um, they actually manufacture safety testing rigs, um, primarily for the transportation industry. And this company is experiencing significant growth in China that is leading them to open a new location, um, a new physical location in China to support that high demand. So, you know, like, like many companies, they weren't able to get away unscathed with IP challenges. Um, that's certainly something that we want to make sure Michigan companies are cognizant of and protected against when they're looking to enter the Chinese market. But um, we do see limited successes, you know, with companies that do enter the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. But overall, as a state, um, for a state program, I should say, um, the MEDC only sees a small fraction of the number of companies that export to China. 
Um, we work with primarily small businesses, but um, over the past several years, we have seen a significant decline in the number of companies that are actively looking to utilize our services to enter the Chinese market. Um, it could be due to a number of reasons, certainly um, trade tensions, political tensions, um, and also the fact that we've we've had less uh, of an emphasis in trade missions um, heading to China. We, we had them every year with our former governor. Um, so there could be a few reasons why that drop-off is, um, is happening, but we know that the opportunity still exists. It's just um, messaging that we're here to support that. Um, and I don't know if Kendra has seen a, a similar decline in numbers of companies looking to utilize their services to access the Chinese market. Um, but we've just, we've, we've seen quite a decline over the past few years. I don't know. Can I, I think for me, we, that? yeah, we're, we're still seeing some, some interesting, you know, projects one-on-one -on -one here. Uh, we had an example of a company in the last couple of years do a project in China. Um, they were looking to find a distributor or a representative that could help license their technology there for the auto industry. And actually they did use step funds to, um, finance their trip there, help help pay for some of their expenses, and we're able to find um, a representative there. So yeah, I think it, it depends on the industry. It depends on, you know, each company's different. So just helping them to know that there are the resources available. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I'd like to get your perspective on this as well, Erkan. I mean, Alyssa mentioned, you know, that there has been a downturn, but, you know, it's hard to actually know why that is. I mean, there's less governor trips, there's trade tensions, and with COVID, there's been tremendous disruption of business all over the world. You know, you're working with companies on these student projects um, pretty, pretty deeply and intensively. You know, I'm curious what your sense is uh, from the companies you're working with about the trends recently on doing business with China? Sure. Um, I guess we can put the uh, Michigan companies doing business with China in two main categories, the upstream players and the downstream players. Mm. Uh, the upstream players are those that outsource manufacturing in Chinese companies to, or to Chinese companies, and then bring it back to the U.S. to either build on top of those intern products and sell them, or sell them as is. So this group of companies seem to have the first hit when the trade war began because the US government's initial approach was discouraging imports from the China. So the you know, US jobs and manufacturing can be protected. That was the idea, right? As a result, some of these Michigan companies started reshoring their manufacturing back to the US. And thus it was an achievement for the US government. Uh, but we also need to acknowledge that some of those companies continued to outsource to China and the remaining just moved their outsourcing locations from China to other countries. So there wasn't a big su success on that side of the story. Then there are the second group of Michigan companies, the down, downstream players. Those are the companies that manufacture uh, somewhere else or in the US and then export their products to China and sell there. And of course, they got their own fair share from the trade war as well, uh, as new tariffs and quotas are implemented by the Chinese government as a response to the US government. These Michigan companies reduce the amount of business they do with China. And the results are what Alyssa uh, uh, just shared with us, declining Michigan export, uh, exports to China. Uh, at at uh, the International Business Center, we witnessed this trend while assisting Michigan companies through the Michigan Export Growth Program as well. So when we start working with a company, they usually pick the target markets they want us to research. In the past, um, most of the companies would ask for market research about China. Uh, but however, for the last couple of years, uh, year and year and a half, uh, roughly, the number of companies asking for market research on China has de declined. Now, this may mean a couple of things. Some of them are really getting affected by the tariffs and the quotas, but some of them are really are affected by the hype. The, they read the news, they see the discussions in these podcasts, and there is this fear factor, I believe, that eventually have an, an effect on the uh, businesses and the, their decisions on expanding their exports to China. Uh, yet, 
the, the exports to China from Michigan are strong, still staying strong. Um, but I also would like to highlight another aspect of the export. So we mostly talk about the, the tangible goods, um, right? But there is also the service providers who export their services to China. Uh, because the services trade is not documented and tracked as detailed as the tangible goods trade, it's sometimes difficult to see the implications of such inter-country tensions on the services exports. But I can give you an example of declining services exports from an institution closer to my heart, MSU, because the trade war has also affected the universities. Um, for MSU, the Chinese student population has always been the largest body of international students, and it still is. However, the number of Chinese students uh, coming to the MSU has declined due to the tensions between the two countries, which you know, keeps affecting our services exports to China at the end of the day for other service exporters as well. I'm curious, um, Erkan, if you wouldn't mind me following up on that. Actually, one of our questions relates to how, you know, recent years with the, a lot of things like you mentioned, like Chinese students, also maybe less funding of centers that focus on China, uh, are there other impacts you've seen in the last few years at the university level that have um, led to less China work, either in your organization or as you've seen it around the university? Well, my experience was just the opposite, actually. As mm -hmm. the number of students declined, the universities, at least at MSU, we gathered and formed these advisory boards, including a lot of folks from China, from South Asia, to be able to understand what the feeling of the students there, how we can bring more students here, how we can still uh, make them sure that this, these institutions in Michigan and across the nation are still providing excellent education for, to those undergrad students, to those master's students. So we only, I guess, step uh, up our uh, game in, in this area and trying to bring in more students as much as possible. Yeah, well, that's, that's great to hear. And, and, and I, I want to remind people to continue asking some, Q, you know, entering Q&As. Those last two questions actually were uh, in part from, from the audience uh, questions. So, so please continue to, to add questions to our Q&A feature. Uh, Mark, I'd like to actually dive a little bit more sort of specifically into the experience of Cherry Central over these last few years. Can you say, I'm, I'm not sure if there's tariffs that hit your products, how the global shipping issues that have stemmed from COVID have affected your work. Can you say a little bit about, I guess, your experience sure. with those, uh, those topics? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've been touching on the, on the trade wars. So just to back up a little bit, um, you know, when, when Cherry Central made the decision to move forward and really shift our focus to building the Chinese market, there's an organization here in the U.S. called the Cherry Marketing Institute that represents the Mount Marenzi industry. And so they were shifting dollars to the market. So again, we kind of tend to follow where they go. So we have a partner in promotion. So they, they work with a sister promotional agency in China. And so we also decided it's the right time to, to move into China and put some efforts into it. Again, we, we touched on the trade shows, the trade missions, um, but even before then, these same groups, they bring buyers to the U.S. That's called an inbound trade mission, where they'll bring in Chinese buyers to the U.S. And this, again, is organized, typically the state of Michigan might be involved or the Cherry Marketing Institute. And so as we're really starting to put our efforts, that's when the politics and the trade really, you know, really affected our business. Um, when things first kicked off, yeah, tariffs were a big part of it. And there is, there's rumblings about it. So people get a little nervous. And I believe I was actually on a trade mission when the news broke that they were implementing retaliatory tariffs to the tariffs that the U.S. put in place. Well, that was obviously not a not the ideal situation when you're there trying to promote your product and promote your company. Right. And so there's really two schools of thought here. Uh, we could turn tail and run and just, you know, change our plans and give up or we could march forward. And so we just decided to march forward. Um, as I learned more about the market and seen the market, I kind of suspected we need boots on the ground. And that's that's what we decided to do. 
Uh, we worked with a consulting firm initially to help us kind of get a grasp on some of the early ideas, early marketing, even helping with some early appointments when I would go over there. Um, you know, not speaking the language, it was a bit challenging. Shortly after that, we decided to, all right, let's have this uh, consulting firm that we're working with start to do some interviewing. So they're lining up resumes. They're kind of doing the initial vetting and screening. And then, you know, we kicked off the interview process. Um, actually, the second round of interviews were during a trade show. I was there and this was probably uh, late 2018, I think it was. And so, yeah, we hired an employee um, again in China, just because we don't have an entity there. Really, the employee is an employee of our consulting firm. That's just the way it works. But they work for Cherry Central. And, you know, so this is all this is all happening as the trade war is building. Uh, we make a decision. We realize not only do we need an employee there, we need product there. So we again, working with our consultant, we've opened a warehouse and opened. We have product at a warehouse in China to help facilitate building the sales. And again, this is all happening, not only trade war, but now what hits? COVID hits. And so kind of the double whammy, right? And again, we could choose to turn tail and run or keep pressing forward, which we've kept pressing forward. Initially, we had contracts canceled. We had R&D projects canceled. People, as I think Aircon was alluding to, they, they see it in the news, they see it in the media, they get scared. There's a big element of unknown. Uh, you know, from the time your product gets on the water to gets to China during the good days pre-COVID, maybe it was 20 to 40 days, depending on where it was leaving from. Um, and you don't know what's going to happen. Your tariffs may jump drastically. So, you know, kind of to, to cap it off, um, even right now, they, I believe it was January 2020, and correct me if someone knows for sure, there was an exception by the Chinese government that you could... I guess, be relieved a little bit of the tariffs, the retaliatory tariffs. And we were fortunate. Our products were part of that to be eligible for the exception. So when we shipped our warehouse there, we are part of the exception. Uh, some of our clients that we've, we've built over the years, uh, they are part of the exception. And really, the, I think the way that we've been able to build is to continue to promote the health benefits of our product, to continue to promote the uniqueness of our product, the flavor profiles, you may need to change your flavor profile for your, some of your product, whether it's North China, South China, Central China. We've been really flexible. We've continued to invest. Um, but if you don't qualify for an exception and you want to buy a, a frozen cherry in China, you're paying an 80% tariff today. Wow. That's, that's huge, huge. You can see how things need to change. Our governments, in my opinion, they need to work things out. And, um, you know, there's a lot of political differences. And unfortunately, sometimes food and ag suffer the brunt of that. You know, their differences maybe aren't on agricultural issues, but that's, this is what happens. So, again, we're fortunate with the exception. Some of our products are much more reasonable. Um, some of our concentrate products or our dried products, with the exception, are 5%. But even with the exceptions, our, our frozen product is still 45% tariff. So it's still having an impact. We've been real fortunate to build sales, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, you know, I just think the fact that we were there and these Chinese companies seen we weren't bailing out, we were committed to the market has really, really helped us in our efforts to, to rebuild the business we lost. And really we're, we're on the path to be much ahead of where we were even before the tariffs, before COVID. Well, that's great to hear both what you were saying and then, you know, Urcon as well. I mean, faced you know, a tremendous amount of challenges, you know, with COVID, with tariffs, with trade war in doing business in China with, or with Chinese, you know, co companies over the past number of years. And, you know, to hear how, you know, your either education work or Cherry Central's work has really worked to meet those challenges and overcome them is, I think, provides a great, you know, set of examples for, for, for our listeners. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to just learn a little bit more, Mark, about how, how you operate your business in China. So you mentioned you have this one employee, you have warehouses. So your sales of the product, are you selling as a, in some ways an ingredient for sure. some health drink? Are you selling cherries in supermarkets, jams? I'm curious how, how you actually get your product from the warehouse into the different stores in China. 
Yeah, great. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So historically, uh, Cherry Central to the international markets has been primarily an ingredient supplier. So you may purchase a Mount Marenzi concentrate and you may use that for maybe it's a brewing operation, distilling uh, beverages, sports drinks, dairy industry, you know, all those types of things. You can use a, a frozen concentrate shipped in big drums, basically. And so that's kind of one of the avenues is we work with manufacturers directly, whether it's concentrate, whether it's a frozen cherry or a dried cherry, uh, different applications. But we, we work really, we don't discriminate. If you're a manufacturer and you want to purchase it directly from us, we're happy to do that. That works really well for us. But I think also, you know, what you realize in the international markets, many times you need distribution. Not everybody is going to start off by building or buying a, a full container of product, which is, that's, that's a big commitment. And yes, they know cherries in China. They love their fresh, dark, sweet cherries. You'll find them all over the place. And so our, our mission, our goal is how to transition the value from, look, you love your dark, sweet cherries to the Montmorency sour cherry. And so we're working on that. And so I mentioned CMI, the Cherry Marketing Institute helps and their partners. Uh, but also we found some distributors who are really helping us to promote our product. Having our warehouse there helps to get out sampling. But distribution is key. And typically, unless you're really, really fortunate, I suppose, one distributor doesn't really check all our boxes. So they may be really tied into the frozen industry, the frozen supply to bakeries, hotels, restaurants, that type of thing. But maybe they've never marketed or worked with dried fruit. So it's finding the right distributors, the key distributors for your products. And sometimes, you know, you might be supplying a, a concentrate product to one or two different distributors because their lanes in business are different. One's mm -hmm. distribution into retail, one's distribution into bulk ingredients. That's really been our key is the bulk ingredients. We do have a retail brand. It's fairly new. So we're doing really some groundwork there to launch that into the Chinese market also. But that that is the key to find the right distributors. And for those, probably in all industries, you, don't think that you have to sign some exclusive agreement. You're going to get that question right away. Can, can we do an exclusive agreement? We need an exclusive agreement. And from their perspective, if they're going to invest their funds in promoting and marketing your product, they want some, some protection. But China is a big place. And so I'm here to tell you, you don't have to sign a, an exclusive agreement to build a relationship with a company. It's kind of like dating before you get married. You typically don't just jump in and get married day one. So that's kind of how I try to approach that. That's one of the, tax, the tactics that we've learned. And there are unfortunately companies, probably in all countries, but I've ran into that have less than admirable uh, intentions. So be, be cautious of that also. Yeah, that's really helpful uh, advice, I think, for, for our listeners. And I think, you know, the last segment of discussion, I'm going to be asking all of you just for your general pieces of advice from the different venues, uh, perches that you have for entrepreneurs, for companies that want to do business in China. But before asking that question, I just want to ask one quick follow-up uh, again for you, Mark. You know, you mentioned there's a different flavor profile, maybe between the North and South in China. Obviously, the Chinese market is so different than the U.S., or I know you guys are also very big in Europe. Uh, can you give me an example or two or give us an example or two of how you've tailored your products or, you know, some research you've done to see, okay, here's how we can best introduce the Mount Marenzi cherries into China? Sure, sure. Well, without giving out too many secrets to my competitors, I can <laughs> give you a little bit of... <laughs> Um, you know, I don't think it's a big secret. So how do you do that? Well, the way we do it or the way I try to do it is really just, I follow online publications. I'm not there in China. I haven't been there in a couple of, couple of years. And um, so there are various online publications that you can pick up flavor profiles, trends. Um, you know, some of the big, you know, international companies, Carry Ingredient is the name of a company that they usually put out profiles of different company or different countries, different regions, flavor profiles. I would say in general, kind of the sweetness level of some of our products, um, you know, not everyone loves sour and not everyone mm -hmm. loves sweet. 
uh, we did a tasting profile in Shanghai where the the men decided they liked the unsweetened product and the women decided they liked the sweetened product. So it's it's a challenge to do, but I guess I would say be open to that. And some of our, our juices, we're definitely looking at different flavor profiles. As I mentioned, we're we're launching our retail products. So we're we're looking at that. What is the right flavor profiles? Because what works in the US or in Europe absolutely may not work in China. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great. So I'm really interested to hear from each of you, you know, what your few pieces of advice would be for, you know, entrepreneurs and business people interested in doing business in China. And and Kendra, why don't we start with you if you don't mind? Great. Yeah. And so much of what I have to say is what Mark has done. It's such a great job of is, you know, find what, what makes you unique. What's your value proposition? know who your competitors are, who are trying to sell here in the U.S., but who, who are the Chinese competitors already in China, either whether they're U.S. competitors or Chinese competitors, and know what makes you special so that you can sell your product. And then also another thing that I've seen that he, he mentioned is that, you know, be in it for the long term. You need to ride the wave of, of the different disruptions that are going on. So understand what some of those challenges are, anticipate what they are, you know, with supply chain issues, um, and you're dealing with different issues there, anticipate what those are and build those into your, your pricing uh, so that you're not surprised in the end and do your homework. Make sure that you know who you're doing business with. Um, don't assume that Beijing is the best market for you. As Mark said, China is a big country. So maybe there's a better opportunity for you in another uh, city or location. So just be open to that, but do your homework. And, and again, there's resources to help you do that. Great. Yeah, that's one thing definitely I've taken away from this is there's tons of, uh, of, of resources throughout the U.S. and different states uh, to, to, to learn about doing business um, in other countries. Alyssa, how about yourself? Yeah, I'll echo Kendra's statement on doing your homework and tapping into the resources. Um, a lot of the services that are available at, at the state and federal level um, are, are available for free. And there's counseling that you can get from international trade managers from MEDC, from the commercial service officers and Kendra's team. Um, There's there's resources out there. There's people that have deep knowledge, deep experience in the Chinese market that are ready and willing to share um, their advice and precautions for entering that market successfully. Um, One particular resource at the MEDC that I think would be really valuable for companies to tap into is our uh, legal services with Foster Swift. Um, They focus a lot on IP protection um, for intellectual property to make sure that your your safeguarded, um, your brand is protected um, in that market. Um, We've got a lot of really just people that have that deep experience that are willing to share that, um, not only from the MEDC side, but also on the federal side and with our district export councils. We've got um, a deck on the east side of the state and a deck on the west side of the state. Um, Those are comprised of business members, like business community members. um, And they're also available to tap into. So um, doing your research is very important, but don't do it alone. Lean on the resources that are available to help you make those informed decisions and perhaps challenge you um, to think of it in new ways, um, your market entry strategy, that is. Great. No, thank you. I was wondering through any of your resources, is there like one page that says, okay, you want to do business internationally or China, you know, here it is, you know, the U.S. Commercial Services, um, you know, the Cyber Center at MSU, the MEDC, is there like one central repository that someone could go to? I can send you a handout. I know Alyssa has a good checklist on her website. Um, We also have an exporter roadmap that we developed this year with one of my new interns. She did a great job of putting all the links together of wherever you're at in the export process. So maybe you're calling me because your stuff's stuck in customs and you need help getting that out. Or maybe you want to be more strategic and thinking long term about what do I need to do? So we kind of outlined the different steps of what you need to consider when you're looking to export. Great. Thank you. So we'll definitely send those over and we can get them in the, the uh, post-show email. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Erkan, a, a couple points about recommendations for folks that are interested in doing business in China. 
I think it has never been easier to export your products than ever. I mean, it's it, it's very easy now when compared to 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Something that I show in my classes to my students over and over again is the uh, the share of exports uh, of uh, within the GDP of countries globally. It has been increasing and the uh, ease of uh, exporting goods and the cost of shipping has been decreasing steadily. There are only two big dents in those graphics, the two world wars. Even the Trump government's tariffs and the trade war that they started didn't have a big dent there. So what I'm trying to say is going up to a 10 mile high view, looking at the one, last 100 years, the, the exports has been growing steadily and they will uh, grow steadily or in a way uh, regardless, uh, out of the Michigan um, state of Michigan to other countries and China as well. So it's the best time and uh, to take advantage of that. And as Kendra and Alyssa highlighted, we have great resources. The One of the things that I also would like to highlight is, again, Alyssa kind of touched base with this. Even though we promote our services as free, when we are promoting those, when we make the first contact with the companies, they still ask, how much they need to pay for it. The services that we provide is paying your taxes back to you. We are here mm -hmm. to help you. Like just reach out to us so that we can provide you as much guidance and research as possible is what I want Great. to say. Yeah, super. Th thank you very much, Arkan. And, and Mark, how about you? You know, from your, all of your experiences on the ground, um, you know, interacting with Chinese partners, you know, what sort of piece of advice would you have for folks? Sure, sure. I would say do what you do best. And what I mean by that in the ag industry here, we supply more than Mount Morenzi cherries, but that is our core item. And so do what you do best. If I'm leading with not our core item, not our specialty, it, it may not be the best approach. And I, and I learned that. So do what you do best and stick to it. Uh, the second thing I guess I would say is um, in China, be prepared to close the business after hours. So yes, you, you have your meetings during the day, but I, I, I'm a firm believer with many companies where you close the deal is with the lunch or is with the dinner after the fact, um, after your meetings are done. I, I think that's when the business really starts. So be prepared There's for that. No alcohol involved in that, is there? <laughs> well, absolutely not. No, no, there, there definitely is. And actually, one of the things that I learned early on was that if you, if you don't drink, that's okay but it's best to let them know ahead of time, not to refuse their offer at the table. Mm -hmm. So yeah. just to, I mean, you could, we could spend an hour just on helpful little hints like that type of thing. But right. I guess in, in closing the, I think the one of the biggest helps for me has been getting to know your foreign ag service people in country. And so whether that's the ATO office, ag trade office, which kind of tends more to focus on promotion or the Office of Ag Affairs, so the OAA, they've been hugely helpful when we have issues with custom clearance and things along those lines. And in China, it seems that one port doesn't require all the same documents or certificates as a port that's 200 miles away. So get to know your, again, free support in country. And it, it, you know whether it's labeling questions, custom clearance questions, or just hey, have you ever heard of this company? Because they're asking for these questions and kind of a little bit of a vetting there. So I think those are the, the few things that could be really helpful for a company breaking into the market. Great. We just have about one more minute left. And I want to ask you a quick follow-up to that. You know, the pace of change in China is much, much quicker than in the U.S. And particularly with the recent you know, slowdowns in, in transportation, how are you thinking about you know, even things like pricing or, you know, making sure that you, when you send something that it's actually, there's going to be a market for it. It's a risk reward. At this point, you pretty much need to park product in our warehouse. Even if, even if we don't have a sale for it, you have to assume the sales are coming. So my advice is to order early and order often. Yeah. Makes sense. Super. Well, we're right at the top of the hour. So just want to thank all of you so much, you know, Mark, Kendra, Alyssa, Erkan, really appreciate you taking the time. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure that our viewers did too. And thank you everyone for joining us on China Corner Office. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for the thank opportunity, you. Chris. Right, take care. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.